Yep, that's all good. Okay. Cool. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. I assume so. Cool. All right, then. Then I'll do my introductions. I'm Sam, and I'll be talking about uh, improving toothpaste retention. I thought I'd shorten the name, make it a bit more snazzier. So the aim of the project is... Oops, is it? Trying to move too many things around. Aim of the project is to improve the retention of toothpaste and the active ingredients inside of it, to develop an in vitro model for being able to measure this retention, and the silica particle parts will gloss over for now. That's a slight thing change. So first of all, have a look at um, toothpaste itself. So quick history of toothpaste as well. So the Egyptians are believed to have started using paste to clean their teeth in 5000 BC, about 2000 years before the toothbrush was invented. So toothpaste and tooth powders were used for the exact same reason then as they are for now, or health, protecting teeth and fresh and breath. And the first modern toothpaste was invented in 1850 and it was called creme dentrifice. So what is toothpaste? So toothpaste is a complex formulation of uh, many different components as well. You've got the active ingredients which take an active role in promoting oral health. So you've got fluoride compounds for remineralizing teeth, the antibacterial agents which kill plaque. You've got the inactive ingredients, you've got the abrasives, and although they do actively remove plaque from your teeth, they are technically make up most of the formulation itself. So they're classed as an inactive ingredient because it gives it properties. You've got the flavours and you've got the thickening agents. So my project mainly looks at fluoride compounds and the flavour compounds. So what's the problem with toothpaste these days? Everyone has toothpaste, it works, but it's continued growth of dental caries throughout the world. The WHO has ranked dental caries as the number one most common disease on the planet, people having it. So current retention time of flavours and active ingredients is quite low at the moment. Within a couple of minutes, most of the flavours have left your mouth and all the fluorides have been rinsed out. And there's no standardised in vitro method for measuring flavour retention or active ingredient retention. So why do we want to retain toothpaste for longer? So it gives more time for the active ingredients to work, such as fluoride for remineralizing teeth as well, and the antibacterial agents are able to kill more, leave a pleasant and aftertaste for a lot longer, and to also increase the amount of protection the toothpaste can offer. So some of the basic toothpaste I use initially to get a baseline for it was a pacified silica base. So this is quite a common modern toothpaste as well. It's quite glossy. It's the general one you will see in most toothpaste as well. You've got the slightly older chalk silica base, which is more traditional, but it's still widely used these days. So I've made a series of novel formulations here. I'm not allowed to dis disclose what they're made from because my company is particularly secret about this, but formulations A, B and C were made using natural polymers and they were compared against Colgate toothpaste, which I'll go on to in a moment, and D, E, F, G, H and I were all made using synthetic polymers as well instead. So Colgate was used as commercial brands to test all these toothpastes against to see whether they're actually more retentive than them or not. So to develop the in vitro model initially, so they had to have a human analog, which was as close to human teeth as possible. So the analog had to be cost effective, had to mimic the human jaw as closely as possible, and had to contain relevant mucosal surfaces on there as well. So it can't be some sort of plastic model as well for it. So it was decided to use a sheep's jaw for this as well. As you can see by the image on the right hand side, most of the teeth are there. So you've got the incisors, the canines, the molars and premolars. If you were to shorten that down so slightly, it would make something similar to a human jaw. So the experiments were to fluorescently mark the toothpaste with sodium fluorescent, was to then brush the teeth on all the surfaces and then was to wash in a tank full of water initially. So, these were the Colgate toothpaste images as well by there. So you can see at, the at zero seconds, you got a good covering all over it as well. And after 30 seconds, most of the toothpaste is washed off the teeth because the teeth are a very hard surface to adhere to. And then as we move on with time, the fluorescence starts to decrease, indicating that there's a loss of toothpaste. So novel formulation I was very good. It showed an improved retention, as you can see over it as well. So after 30 seconds and 60 seconds, you can still see some of the toothpaste is on the teeth still. There's quite a lot retained in between the teeth and on the tongue. And even up to 300 seconds, there's still quite a lot of toothpaste retained around the teeth, which is considerably better than the Colgate, which ran out after 120 seconds. So the main points you want to be looking at on this one are I, the blue one, and the Colgate, which is the gold one you'll be able to see on this all the way throughout that the eye toothpaste is higher 
well, shows more fluorescence. Uh, I can't include statistics on this because there's too many of them, but it was st st uh, statistically significant on every point compared to Colgate. Again, on the tongue retention, it retains a lot better on the tongue because it's a larger mucosal surface. But again, after 300 seconds, I was statistically significant. It was shown, so it showed higher retention. And on the molars as well, slightly more protected than the rest of the teeth as well. It showed again, more retention. So a second methodology to confirm this was developed as well. So this one is very similar to quite a lot of the other work that's done in the Katoriansky group. So you've got your tongue, you've got a syringe that drips onto it, and then you basically measure the fluorescence over time. So this was done on a tongue. So this is a Colgate one as well. You can see as the toothpaste starts to fade over time where the water hits it in the center of the surface. And then compared to eye formulation on the right-hand side, you'll see the results for it. The eye was again, showed higher fluorescence, although this was just initial testing as well. So further testing is needed. Uh, hopefully when this virus is over, we can actually get this all done. So to conclude quickly, so a toothpaste formulation with improved adhesion was developed as well. So further tests is needed for this as well. Incorporation of flavors and sodium fluoride is currently ongoing on it as well to measure to see whether it retains fluorides better as well. And uh, essentially sensory work will be carried out on all of this soon when we all go back. And I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd like to thank my supervisors and ask if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much, Sam. I would strongly encourage everyone to ask questions. I cannot ask a question because I'm a supervisor. <laughs> Anyone? Come on. I'm sorry. Yeah. Could you please ask some questions? I mean, why didn't you prefer Colgate to space? So, so, Britain? so I have got some other toothpaste I was in the middle of testing, but my sponsor seems really keen on trying to beat Colgate toothpaste. So I'm not quite sure whether they're going to sell the idea to them or they just really, really don't like them. But Colgate was the first one they asked me to do. And I've got some Aquafresh and some other brands as well. But they show quite similar properties to Colgate. So I'm kind of expecting the results to be in the same range as theirs. Thank you, guys. Okay, any more questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, Sam, uh, why did you use SHIP as a model for your toothpaste? I mean, for an in vivo model? So from the animals that were capable, so one of the questions I got asked at a previous conference was why don't I use monkeys? Because their jaws will surely be yeah. closer to humans. Well, I can't get hold of monkeys on a regular basis. So it's slightly harder to use them. So they have to be easily available. Uh, so the only animals really were pigs, they were sheep, or they were um, cows, and cows' jaws are massive compared to humans. Uh, pigs' teeth are very sharp and not very like human teeth as well, so sheep were the closest model that was quite easily available and quite cheap and, yeah, usable. So it's decided to use sheep. And previous work by a student called Enrique as well also showed that sheep jaws were the best to go for in this case. So it's a standard model? Uh, it is now because there was no there was no method for measuring this at the moment. The way they test it in industry is they literally brush a plastic jaw and then leave oh, it for okay. a few seconds and come back to see does it smell yes or no. <laughs> so this is uh, as uh, basically as lifelike as you can get without brushing a human's teeth at the moment. Okay. Any more questions? If no, then thank you very much, Sam. And right. we will proceed to our next speaker, Dowlet. I've seen Dowlet online. Right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me share. Um, just a moment. Sharing. Yeah, this one. Can you see? Not the screen, just you. Let me again. Yeah. 
Can everyone see? Hey. Yes, folks. No. Hi. Hi, Tari. Yes. Yes. Can everyone can see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can see. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. I just want to uh, respond from everyone. So, uh, thank you very much, Vitaly. Uh, my topic today is called uh, Mechanical Malian Mind Functionalized Nano Carriers. For interface directive, this is the research work I've done uh, over the two periods of my postdoc appointment, and my previous postdoc appointment in the uh, uh, University of Reading Pharmacy Department. And uh, um, basically, I will talk about liposomes and uh, PLG nanoparticles. Uh, just a brief um, um, uh, statistics. Uh, this is the update statistics uh, uh, from, from the uh, International Agency for, for Research on Cancer. Um, uh, the, um, the, the main the, the, the main investigation was the uh, bladder cancer. So, uh, if you can see uh, in the flash sheets. The bladder cancer has the tens highest incidence rate uh, and tens most common cancer in the, both in the UK and in Kazakhstan. And uh, males are more uh, likely to, to develop this condition than females. So this is a just brief uh, fact. So uh, provide that this is the urinary bladder. Uh, the, the normal function of the urinary bladder is the Three hundred million. It triggers the urge to urinate, and uh, and urinary bladder uh, quite uh, is highly quite highly impermeable um, in nature. So uh, to treat bladder cancer, there are uh, different types of uh, uh, specific type of uh, administration is called intravesical drug delivery. Drug delivery. So um, compared to um, Mm, systematic administration, it has the minimized uh, side effects. You can directly insert the uh, drug uh, to, into the, the urinary body using the catheter. So, uh, but basically, uh, it, it used um, uh, to to insert the um, chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agents like vitamin C or toxicobutene. But this uh, list of administration uh, only effective when uh, uh, is administered when is uh, used for non-invasive and minimally invasive uh, blood cancer, uh, so-called zero stage and zero to one stages of blood cancer. So, um, to, so there are different strategies that could be improved these route of administration, and uh, you, you, you might use liposomes, protein uh, nanoparticles, biopolymers, uh, or nanoparticles or gold nanoparticles, so different strategies. Um, in our cases, um, we used uh, liposomes and we, we used conventional liposomes and regulated liposomes. And uh, additionally, we used a monomite functionalized uh, regulated liposomes. So uh, these are type of uh, drug conjugation, uh, sorry, um, the monomite functional groups conjugation is so-called third generation of polymers uh, that used to enhance the uh, adhesiveness of the polymers. So um, uh, these the liposomes uh, uh, generally they are non-toxic, bi-compatible and completely biodegradable. They could increase the drug efficacy and reduce the toxicity of encapsulated drug. We might use all the, the uh, non-water soluble uh, drugs uh, in, in an encapsulate between the bilayer and uh, or and it has uh, low uh, side um, effects. Um, again, uh, uh, we used uh, three types of um, um, liposomes: the conventional and pegylate and pegylate malleable functionalized uh, pegylate liposomes. <clears throat> so uh, we characterize this uh, 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 liposome of formulations. 
uh, using dynamite scattering just to see the, uh, the, uh, the, the size of the nanomaterials. And as you can see, uh, they are quite uh, about between, 900, uh, between 90 and 100 uh, nanometers. And it has uh, low PDI values. Uh, and we also uh, uh, calculated uh, the inflation efficiency <coughs> and the capacity parameters. Um, and this um, uh, uh, parameter was uh, uh, fully confirmed with the, with the transmission electron microscopy. So uh, we can see that uh, they are quite uh, almost the same size as proof uh, with the TM DLS uh, instruments. So uh, the next one, the next stage, we uh, use these light zones to uh, 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 to assess the adhesiveness uh, on, on the water mucosal. Uh, so first we have the, the uh, channel. Um, so this is typically the same uh, uh, procedure developed in the laboratory. So we uh, I take pores and blood tissue placed on the channel, and then. Uh, um, uh, on the top of the blood uh, tissue, we, I place the sodium uh, fluorescent and uh, we, I washed the uh, artificial urine out of 100 milliliter. And then we progressed this, uh, the retention using the fluorescent microscopy and we have uh, lots of uh, pictures taken <clears throat> and then analyzed with image uh, software. This is the image, uh, the, uh, the um, you know, uh, wash out uh, uh, images of the tissue with the fluorescent uh, over the uh, time period. Um, then uh, we convert this, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the can you hear me? Yes, now yes. Excuse me, I think some kind of problems with the interconnection. So uh, the, we, uh, we compared the mechanisms of malamide functionalized paired liposomes, well known mechanisms of chitosan, and the less uh, mechanisms of uh, fitzitran. And we can see there is uh, no significant difference between the chitosan and malamide functionalized liposomes, but we can see the quite statistically different between, uh, uh, difference between the malamide functionalized uh, 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 liposomes and conventional li uh, liposomes. Oh. And, and uh, also we, uh, sorry, um, also we uh, assess the washout profiles uh, of these uh, uh, formulations. Uh, this is the washout profile, uh, uh, washout value is used to uh, uh, to remove the 50% of the mucus uh, uh, materials from the substrate uh, with the uh, liquid, um, artificial liquid, for, uh, artificial uh, urine solution, for instance, in, uh, in my case. So, uh, and then, um, assess the concentration of these uh, liposome uh, formulations. And, and interestingly, the pegylated liposomes they are found to be more uh, uh, penetrative than compared to malamide function like uh, liposomes time span. And as you can see uh, in this uh, uh, slide, so we assess the, uh, the penetration using the fluorescent uh, microscopy again, uh, uh, and the, uh, we, there was quite high statistical difference between the uh, pegylate liposomes and malamide liposomes, pegylate, malamide function like liposomes. Uh, and then also we uh, um, uh, create the in vitro release profile and as you can see, the uh, malamide functionalized PEG liposomes had uh, uh, the uh, late re release as compared to the uh, uh, other types of liposomes. And this could also improve the efficacy of the, uh, the drug penetration uh, into the blood, in the urinary blood wall. On the next slide, um, uh, we developed PLG PEG nanoparticles. Uh, just schematic diagram showing how we prepared uh, these um, nanoparticles. We have both uh, uh, with and without malamide uh, groups on the surface uh, using the uh, self assembly uh, 
procedure. So we use two different types of uh, uh, solvents, Acton and DMC, just to see what the difference in the um, size. And, and as we can see, uh, as proved to DLS, um, random light scattering technique, uh, uh, the uh, particles prepared from the uh, acetone, uh, I mean, um, precipitate from the acetone had the uh, low value size compared to DMSO. So we think it is the, these are the um, uh, moments of the solvent and other factors uh, related to the solvent. So we, see, we can see that quite narrow size distribution of, of the, of these, the uh, particles and the size of these particles uh, were further confirmed with the microscopy and they all had the same, quite the same uh, values. And also uh, these um, um, particles were further confirmed uh, to the research with the small angle neutron scattering. And uh, as we can see, um, the duration radius, so there is a different type of uh, parameters we have to fit in. So one of them is duration uh, 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 the, uh, radius. As we can see, they are this, uh, these the values are quite uh, similar to the uh, DLS um, parameters. So we think that the uh, malleolite groups attached to the dangling pack uh, chains increase the duration radius of the pack uh, for the nanoparticles precipitate from the uh, uh, DMSO. But for the NP, uh, nanoparticles precipitate from acetone, we might expect that some of the malleolite groups, due to the hydrophobic nature of the uh, malleolite group, they will have the tendency uh, to incorporate into smooth PLD and PEC uh, uh, interface. So uh, there was the quite uh, difference when uh, in the size when prepared uh, when precipitate in the acetone. The next slide, the same technique we applied uh, uh, using uh, uh, we as, uh, when we assessed uh, the uh, mucoadhesiveness of these um, formulations uh, using the flow through method, uh, as uh, uh, discussed on the uh, previous slides. And then uh, we converted these uh, numbers, in, uh, sorry, in first intensity into numbers, and, uh, and we can see, uh, we plot the diagram. So we can see there is quite a high statistical difference between the, um, uh, the, the nanoparticles. For instance, uh, we, uh, the PEG malumite functionalized, um, sorry, malumite functionalized PEG PLG nanoparticles with the uh, uh, 500 um, molecular weight of the PEG chain. Uh, they uh, had the uh, quite high uh, statistical difference. Uh, I mean, we had guessing uh, in terms of this, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, we had guessing this. So um, we can see that there is quite high uh, statistical difference between the malleolite functionalized particles uh, and without malleolite groups. And we also assessed, assessed these uh, malleolite uh, functionalized polymers uh, using uh, tox uh, slack because of irritation test, the toxicity. So uh, we collected these um, um, the, uh, slacks. We, as we can see, we kept in glass beakers, uh, put in the, uh, uh, the glass beakers uh, for two, uh, two days, soaked, uh, uh, placed on the um, paper towel, soaked with a PBS. And when we weighed this, uh, uh, like individual, each individual day, uh, slugs before the experiments. And then uh, the test material was uh, moistened, uh, the filter paper was moistened with the test material. And uh, we placed these uh, slugs, each individual slugs, and just uh, 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 see the, how they respond uh, to the irritant. So we placed for the, uh, uh, onto the um, petri dishes, uh, motioned with the, uh, uh, the fill the paper motioned with the uh, test materials uh, for the contact for one hour uh, uh, contact. So and then we rinse each uh, individual um, slugs again, rare weight, and we calculate the mucus production. As we can see here, uh, 
we've, we had uh, positive and negative controls. As the positive control we used, benzylcholine chloride, basically used, um, mostly used in the uh, uh, disinfectant or... Um, uh, Sorry, Dolet, we're running out of time. If you could bring it just, to a uh, conclusion. Can, just, uh, yeah, uh, and we can see that there is quite statistical difference between this uh, uh, positive control and the, the, uh, the, the we used, the concentration that we used and the particles concentration we used in our experiments. As we can see again, uh, over the increasing uh, concentration of particles, we can see there is no statistical difference. Uh, and, uh, as, uh, and also we compared with the uh, malimide hexanoic acid quite used in the EDC NHS um, uh, 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 modification of the polymers. Uh, and we can see that uh, hexanoic acid, it is acidic nature, first, first of all, uh, it has the uh, irritation to the uh, uh, effect to the uh, uh, each uh, slugs. So, um, as a conclusion, we've prepared the malamide functional liposomes and uh, uh, PLG nanoparticles. These malamide groups can uh, enhance the mucus of these particles on the urinary bladder, and these vehicles could also be used in intravenous contractility. Uh, yeah. And also, the results published in these two. Uh, Papers um, and also uh, I thank uh, I acknowledge the uh, British Council Newton FRV partnership program who was the sponsor of this for the research and uh, particularly to uh, principal invest investigator Vitaly Kuyansky and uh, Sergei Filipov uh, for the help with the uh, science experiments and the discussion with the um, in, uh, discussion of these these results and also Dr. Prasad Chai Tumardom. Uh, working uh, for the help with the liposome experiments. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I'm afraid in the interest of time we have to leave you without questions because we yeah, are sorry. running uh, out of time. Uh, yeah, you, I expect the questions so you can um, uh, write down uh, uh, yeah, in chat. Yeah, yeah, in a chat. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Okay, uh, we'll have to move on and uh, the next speaker will be Alexandra Sitinkova from Kazan State Medical University. And uh, Alexandra will present a talk on interpolymer complexes based on nutrient copolymers as carriers for gastroretentive drug delivery. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks to Professor Kutaryansky for inviting me. And uh, today's my topic is interpolymer complexes based on eudergic copolymers as carriers for gastroretentive control drug delivery. So, and uh, uh, as you know, there are uh, some uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients whose absorption zone is limited to the upper part of the gastrointestinal tract. And if we can prolong the residence time of such drugs uh, in stomach, this will allow us to increase the bioavailability of these drugs. And also sometimes, uh, in uh, the other hand, uh, sometimes it's necessary to deliver drug into stomach for a local action. And for these purposes, we can use um, gastroretentive drug delivery systems. And uh, there are uh, some approach how to achieve, achieve these gastroretentive uh, drug delivery. Uh, such as uh, floating systems, by adhesive, high density, and expandable systems. And in our research group, we uh, developed into polymer complexes and investigate their properties like carriers for control drug delivery. And uh, um, you know what is interpolymer complexes are product between two uh, macromolecules, two counter charge or two chemically complementary macromolecules. And earlier in our scientific group, we investigate complexation between uh, copolymers named eudrogids. And uh, um, uh, eudrogids are copolymers manufactured by Evoni company. Uh, from Germany, and uh, they are widely used in pharmaceutical technology, like uh, different coatings for tablets, for example. And uh, as you can see, uh, according to structure, according to presence in the structure of these uh, copolymers, uh, such groups like dimethylamine group in structure of uh, EPO and uh, carboxylic groups in structure of polyanions, uh, we can obtain uh, interpolymer complexes between these copolymers. And for synthesis of interpolymer complexes based 
on aggregate copolymers, uh, we used simple method of mixing copolymer solutions. And we made synthesis, uh, synthesis of interpolymer complexes in different conditions, uh, in different solvents, uh, with different ratio of initial copolymers and with different order of mixing. And uh, we obtained uh, uh, 12 samples of uh, interpolymer complexes, uh, as you can see from this slide. And then we decided to investigate, uh, uh, yes, like usually we use uh, infrared spectroscopy and uh, differential scanning polarimetry to prove that we obtained interpolymer complexes and these interpolymer complexes stabilized, uh, uh, stabilized uh, intermacromolecular coordination bonds, like here, for example, stabilized by ionic bonds, and then uh, also we made uh, differential scanning colorimetry. Uh, but then we decided to check is it possible to use our uh, interpolar complexes for gastroretinative drug delivery system as carriers for gastroretinative drug delivery system and especially for clotting drug delivery systems. And we've taken um, eight samples of our interpolymer complexes, like here, from, you can see from this slide. And then third step was uh, to make assessment of the behavior of our interpolymer complexes in a uh, uh, medium mimicking stomach, medium, mimic, uh, medium stomach, um, uh, medium uh, with pH 1.2. And we made uh, um, um, compacts with our interpolymer complexes by direct compression. And then we immerse these compacts into medium with pH 1.2. And then we weight uh, these samples uh, during uh, all experiments during period of time. And as you can see, uh, only four complexes from eight um, save their shape and uh, withstand all uh, conditions of experiment. It's ABC2, uh, 4, 6, and 8. And then we've chosen these uh, interpolymer complexes for our next uh, experiment. And then uh, next our step was to uh, choose uh, a floating agent for floating system. We need to choose floating agent. And like floating agent, uh, we've chosen uh, two carbonates, calcium carbonate and sodium carbonate. And uh, we again made uh, interpolymer compacts, but now with uh, uh, interpolymer complex with mixture with floating agent with carbonate. And then we merged our compacts into uh, media mimicking uh, uh, stomach with pH 1.2. And uh, we measure lag time and total floating time. Lag time is uh, time from uh, immersion, uh, immersion compact into our medium until it uh, uh, appears on uh, the surface of the medium. And as you can see, lag time for uh, both uh, uh, floating agents is uh, uh, a bit more than seconds, and it's enough for floating system. But uh, what about total floating time? Uh, in total floating time, in the case of using calcium carbonate, we have only one minute, and of course it's not enough for floating system. And therefore we've chosen like a floating agent for our systems, uh, sodium carbonate. And then we again make, made assessment of swelling properties, but now we made uh, compacts uh, with uh, polycomplexes and a uh, floating agent. And as you can see from four uh, samples, uh, only two samples, IPC2 and IPC8, say their shape and have uh, enough uh, swelling properties, swell enough uh, uh, during experiment. And then uh, we suppose that to these uh, samples of interpolymer complexes are perspective like carriers for uh, floating uh, delivery systems. And uh, like motor drugs, uh, uh, we've used uh, uh, here uh, to um, API is propranolol and menformin, and again we made compacts with uh, uh, interpolymer complex, a floating agent, and uh, API, and uh, we measure lag time, and then we made assessment of release properties uh, using uh, USP2 apparatus, a rotating, uh, rotating puzzle. 
And as you can see, for both uh, complexes, IPC2 and IPC8, uh, lifetime uh, is 30 seconds, it's enough, it's good. Uh, but, uh, and uh, these um, complexes are provide, um, provide uh, a prolonged release of uh, propranol. But what about metformin? In the case of metformin, only IPC8 provides us uh, enough lifetime and uh, um, classical prolonged profile of release of metformin. So, and then uh, we have decided uh, to check: is it possible? Is it possible to? Uh, use our complexes in bioadhesive gastroalternative systems. And uh, I have just three slides more, I think. Uh, and this um, uh, work was made by our stu uh, student, Daria Gardeva, and uh, taken four last uh, uh, samples of our complexes uh, from IPC9 to IPC12. And as you can, uh, again, first our step was uh, assessment of swelling properties in medium uh, mimicking stomach with pH 1.2. And um, uh, as you can see, only IPC10 and IPC11 uh, swell enough and save their shape during all experiment. And then we measure, uh, we make assessment of adhesive properties of interpolymer complex, like substrate here, we used uh, compacts of mucin. And as you can see, work, and we measure work of adhesion, and uh, uh, work of adhesion for um, interpolymer complexes uh, is more than uh, work of adhesion for individual copolymers, more than for negative control, and in some cases it's comparable with positive control. And then, uh, like, um, Model drug here we use uh, metronidazole and we made uh, uh, investigate a release of metronidazole using USP4 apparatus, flow for cell apparatus. And as you can see, that all four uh, samples of uh, IPC uh, provide prolonged release profile of metronidazole, but only in the case of IPC11, uh, we obtain total amount of released substance here is approximately 80 percent so and according to all these results we made such conclusion as that uh, ipc based on a positive charge u digit copolymers are perspective like carrier for floating drug delivery systems with propranolol and metformin it's uh, they are ipc2 and ipc8 and ipc11 is perspective like carrier for gastrointestinal by adhesive drug delivery systems so, and that's all. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And questions to Alexandra, I would suggest we'll, we'll stick to one or two questions, very quick ones, because we are slightly running out of time. Please, Sorry. anyone? Uh, please, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, uh, Alexander, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, don't you think about using these polymers in uh, veterinary because I know that domestic cats and dogs have a lot of gastrointestinal problems and they use human drugs to cure it because there are no good veterinary drugs. Oh, you know that uh, we didn't think about it, but I think that it's interesting and of uh, course we can try to, to make assessment and to use this in internal too. Why not? Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, please? Uh, I have a question about the yes. uh, release study of the drug. Uh, did you do the release of, uh, of the pure drug? A release of pure drug? Yeah. No. Uh, the uh, yeah, a pure drug without uh, IPC like, uh, like control, yes? I mean, Oh, unfortunately, here not, but uh, we know about uh, mm, according properties of this drug. Uh, you know, yes, yes, you're right. Maybe it will be better to make a pure drug, or maybe, you know, that for, like I think that for pharmaceutical purposes, it's, 
even better to take uh, like uh, like control some uh, drug with some I mean dosage form with metronidazole or with uh, another thing, but not like pure drug, but uh, some dosage form. I mean commercially used dosage form. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to move on, and our next speaker in this session is Xiao Nun Shang from University of Reading. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the paper uh, I'm going to publish, uh, which is about polymer structure and property effects on amorphous solid dispersions with hyperidol. So what is solid dispersion? So dispersion is defined as dispersion of at least the two active components, generally hydrophilic nitric and hydrophobic drug, at a solid state prepared by melting method or solvent method. So there's three possible structures of uh, solid dispersion. Uh, structure A is, uh, the, is the ideal structure that uh, um, the drug is molecularly dispersed in the polymer matrix. Structure B is, um, uh, is a polymer drug system where the uh, crystalline drug has formed. In, in the polymer matrix. Structure C is kind of medium uh, structure between A and B, uh, and um, uh, the amorphous structure which domain this first in the polymer matrix. So why do we prepare the cell dispersion? Um, um, when the cell dispersion uh, comes in contact with the uh, with an aqueous medium, for example, the water in the stomach, the polymer matrix dissolves and the drug is released. Uh, and increase the surface area, improve the uh, desorption rate, so that increase the um, oral bioavailability of the purely uh, soluble uh, of the poorly soluble drug. So the drug used here is haliparidol, and there are two main categories of polymer used in this project. Uh, uh, one is PVP, the other one is polyalkyl oxaline, uh, short for POS. In terms of polyalkyl oxaline, four types of uh, poles were used, uh, which were P modes, P L's, P N poles, and P I poles. So among these uh, uh, components, hyperidol PVP and uh, polyethyl oxaline could be available from the commercial market. But for P modes, uh, P N poles, and P I poles, because they are not available, so we have to synthesize them. So this is a synthesis. Um, uh, this is a synthesis of uh, P modes, P N poles, and P I poles. Um, basically, the commercial PLs were subjected to an acidic hydro uh, hydrolysis to produce PI, linear PI, and the linear PI was uh, reacquilated by acetic hydride, butyric hydride, and isobutyric hydride to synthesis P moles, P N poles, and P I poles respectively. Uh, the most significant advantage of the synthesis is that the uh, number of the repeat units for all the polymers could be uh, remain the same, uh, which means that the impact caused by the um, chain length of the polymer uh, would be eliminated. Okay, sorry guys, <laughs> looks there's something wrong with the uh, internet connection. Okay, so. Uh, the successful synthesis was characterized by uh, the proton MR spectra uh, and uh, the FTR spectra, as well as the uh, X-ray diffraction diffractograms. Um, it was noted here that uh, PVP, PLs, PMOS, and PNPOS uh, are morphous. However, the PI pose is semi crystalline, which could be proved by the sharp peak at 8.140 degree. And then the uh, salt dispersion was prepared by solvent evaporation and the DMA was used as a co-solvent to dissolve the polymer and drug. So at first, the polymer and drug was dissolved in DMA and mixed by a vortex mixture. And then uh, the, uh, after complete the dissolution, the, the solution was transferred to a petri dish. Uh, and then the solvent was evaporated by evaporation at 50 degrees uh, on heating beds. And then the uh, solid was uh, kept in a vacuum for three to four days to remove the residue DMA. And then the dried solid was collected by spatula and characterized by DSC, X-ray, and FTR. So because I've got uh, a lot of data, um, including all the polymer haliparidol cell dispersion, so here I only uh, select the one polymer uh, haliparidol cell dispersion because it's impossible to, to, to show all the data here. So here's the DSC thermograms of PVP haliparidol cell dispersion. The DSC curves uh, showed uh, uh, broader and uh, reduced the peaks corresponding to the crystalline drug uh, with increase of PVP. And the haliparidol melting peak was uh, absent at the in the solid dispersion of PVP haliparidol 5 to 1, 
indicating that the, the, the drug became a more complete amorphous. So here's the X-ray diffraction diagrams of PVP heliparadosal dispersions. Uh, the, uh, the, the, crystalline, the drug crystallinity was gradually decreased with the increase of PVP. And a fully amorphous salt dispersion was observed at 5 to 1, uh, which is in agreement with the uh, BSD results. So here's the result, here's the FTR spectral of PV hyperidol uh, salt dispersion. And the peak at 3100 was assigned to the hydroxy group of hyperidol. The peak at uh, 1655 was assigned to the carbonyl group of PVP. Um, so the, the peak at 3100 was lost with a broad peak at 3408 and 3440. Um, um, as the molar ratio increased to 2 to 1 and 5 to 1, respectively, um, indicating a, a change in the environment of a hydroxy group. Um, um, in addition, uh, there were two peaks observed at 1654 and 1648, um, uh, suggesting that uh, hydrogen bonding was, uh, was formed between PVP and hyperidol. Uh, here's the crystallinity of polymer uh, hyperidol salt dispersions as a function of polymer molar fraction. The degree of crystallinity was calculated by uh, the equation here, uh, and where the, spe uh, the, uh, the specific enthalpy of the drug melting peak was obtained by DSC. So it could be seen from this figure that uh, PI poles and P, P moles show the similar ability to reduce the crystallinity, and the PN poles and PUs uh, show the similar ability um, and better than PI poles and P moles to reduce the um, drug crystallinity. And PVP is the best polymer among all these polymers to reduce the crystallinity. So how to uh, how to ex explain this result? There were two uh, uh, theoretical methods to explain this result. The first one is the uh, calculation of hydrophilic hydrophobic uh, balance values, uh, balance values for polymers. The premise of this method is that uh, HHB value is proportional to hydrophobicity. Uh, the second method is calculation of solubility parameters. The premise of this method is that uh, the solubility parameter difference between a polymer and drug is, uh, if, if, the, if this difference is lower than seven, the system is miscible. If the difference is higher than 10, the system is immiscible. So according to the HHB value, uh, the PMOS is the most hydrophilic polymer, and PEOs and PN poles are more hydrophobic than PMOS, uh, which means that um, uh, compared to the amorphous hyperidol molecules in the salt dispersion with PMOS, uh, the, uh, there, there were more uh, nonpolar hyperidol molecules molecularly dispersed in uh, the uh, hydrophobic domains of uh, PAOs and PN, PN poles. Uh, so this could explain that uh, P, uh, why PAOs and P, PI poles, uh, sorry, PN poles and PAOs uh, are better than PMOs to reduce the crystallization. And in addition, the, um, uh, according to the solubility parameter difference, uh, PMOs is a polymer who is the least likely to uh, miscible with hyperidol and PAOs and PN poles are more um, uh, likely to be miscible with hyperidol. Also, this could uh, support uh, the um, experimental data. Uh, and for PI poles, uh, yeah. okay, uh, P, uh, according to the HHB value, PI poles um, show the similar value to PAOs and PN poles. Um, uh, according to the solubility parameter, PI poles also, show, also showed the similar value to PAOs and PN poles, but actually PI poles is not as good as PN poles and P, PAOs. Instead, PMOS is uh, as poor as PI poles. Uh, sorry, PI poles is um, as poor as PMOS. So this could be explained by the semi uh structure. Here's the uh, different uh, structures of a solid person uh, formed by fully amorphous and semi line polymers. Um, so because PI poses semi line, so uh, it, it is more difficult for hyperidol molecules to uh, penetrate into the densely packed polymer crystalline zone. Um, for PVP, although PVP is not the most hydrophobic polymer according to the HEV value, and it's not the polymer which is most likely to be miscible with hyperidol, uh, but PVP is the best polymer to reduce the crystallization of hyperidol. Uh, this could be explained by the hydrogen bonding between PVP and hyperidol. Here's a dissolution profile of pure hyperidol and different polymer hyperidol salt dispersion at polymer hyperidol 5 to 1 molar ratio. So as uh, it could be seen from the figure that the dissolution rate of these polymers was consistent with the crystallization inhibition, inhibition uh, in, 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 
crystallization inhibition uh, with an exception of PM poles uh, because the lower uh, critical solution temperature of PM poles is um, 25 degree, which is much lower than the temperature used in the dissolution study, 37 degree. So in this condition, um, uh, this will limit the drug release from the solid portions. Okay, uh, that's uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions? A quick question, please. Could you please answer the question? Uh, so you could check uh, using DSC as the interaction phenomena between uh, galloperidol and PVP. And uh, so uh, did you use uh, Gordon-Taylor equation in order to calculate the interactions phenomena? Uh, I did not use that. Do you mean the... Um uh, the equation to predict the immutable system. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, um, I've, I've already submitted this paper to the International Journal of Pharmaceutics, and I've got this uh, suggestion from one reviewer, and he also mentioned that uh, um, maybe I, I can use the, the, the equation that you mentioned to predict the, um, the miscible system or immiscible system. Uh, I, I haven't done that, but I will do it soon. Good, thank you. Any more quick questions? If no, then thank you very much. Thank you. And I will pass over to my colleague, Professor Kudaipergen, who will be chairing the next session. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kudaryansky. Uh, it looks like... Uh, I want, I want to introduce, uh, this is the next speaker, Janard Nurakhmetov from Institute of Polymer Materials and Technology. Uh, her presentation is Physical Chemical and Drug Delivery Profits of Please, Janard. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We are late, we are late five, five minutes, uh, as much as we can, please speak. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. The topic of my presentation, physical, chemical, and the drug delivery properties of gelan um, gum. Uh, over the past few decades, uh, microbial polysaccharides have been under intense investigation due to the advantages of physical chemical properties. One of the most um, studied, uh, most studied and uh, comprehensively described member of this uh, group, uh, Gelan. Gelan is a linear polymer uh, polysaccharide, uh, repeating unit containing uh, consisting tetras uh, tetrasaccharide, uh, and the repeating unit uh, contain carboxyl and uh, hydroxyl groups. Uh, Groups uh, and the uh, Gilan uh, currently uh, widely used um, uh, as a potent multifunctional addi additives for pharma pharmaceutical uh, products. Gilan is non toxic and not harmful for human and body. Uh, it's commonly accepted that Gilan exhibits a conformational change from disordered state to the ordered states and double change in the Zolgeld phase transition in the presence of mono and the divalent cations. Um, here you can see morphology of Gilan in the presence of calcium cations. Uh, and uh, uh, we have, uh, in this connection, we have studied um, Zolgeld phase transition of Gilan in the, uh, in the uh, salt water solutions. Uh, I have found that if the effectiveness of salts to enhance gelation changed in the following order. Um, barium chloride, uh, calcium chloride, uh, in, in then magnesium chloride, uh, potassium chloride, and the sodium chloride. Uh, here you can see various uh, formulation um, uh, various uh, gelation of gelan in the different concentration of uh, salts. And uh, 
specific gelling properties of gelan uh, in different media uh, in media lead to development of control re release form species of gelan mechanical properties of gelan in gel induced by addition of salts uh, you can synthesize uh, hydrogels uh, hydrogels uh, of gelan in any form uh, gelan gel show good mechanical properties you can see um, mechanical strengths of uh, in the uh, uh, like as the, as the, um, forming uh, gel sodium chloride potassium magnesium and calcium chloride the logical properties of gelan the logical characteristics of gelan and solutions were evaluated independence of polymer concentration and added salt at the interval of temperature um, 25 and uh, 70 uh, degrees Celsius. The shear stress shear rate curves of the um, 0.5% uh, wet gelan solutions on temperature show pseudoplastic uh, uh, behavior at the interval of uh, 50, um, 55 and the 70 degrees Celsius Newtonian uh, liquid. Uh, Newtonian liquid. Step by step uh, transformation of gelan solution from pseudo, pseudo plastic behavior to Newtonian may be explained by melting of double stand, uh, standard structure of gelan and formation of gelan macromolecules in random soil conformation at higher temperature. And the pseudoplastic behavior of um, behavior of gelan can be successfully applied in the formulation of of, of aromatic preparation as uh, thickening and the gelling component. As seen from table one, in spite of um, wide application of gelan drug combination in ophthalmology as well as in medicine and pharmacy the application of novel eye drops of prolonged action based on gelan and the flaxin in ophthalmology was not described in yet in literature it is expected that immobilization of of flaxin in the hydrogel matrix of gelan will increase the efficiency of targeted delivery of drug up to one toward the decrease the dosage of the drug up to 5-10 times in comparison with traditional use preparation. As distinct from existing formulation, you use the soil gel, uh, gel transition of gelan under the influence of styling tear, tears leading to formation of thin layer on the surface of eye. It's expected that oflaxin Immobilized using gelan matrix fuse outside and they give prolonged effect. Mm. Preparation of coal of nano rods. Uh, gelan gum coated gold nano rods. First, um, um, gelan nano rods separated from. Uh, 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 nano rods were prepared following the seed meditate growth method, then uh, separated uh, from cetyl 3 methyl ammonium bromide, and um, then washed after, uh, by the dianozide water. After wash, washing twice, uh, the nano rods um, resuspended in the uh, solution of gelan. Here you can see absorption spectra of gelan nano rods. Uh, also, team images of gold nano rods. Uh, here, schematic representation of nano uh, gold uh, rods synthesizing. Uh, gold nanoparticles with controlled geometrical, optical, and surface chemical properties are. As a priority research of intense studies and applications in cancer diagnosis, 
treatment and abstract delivery system. Can, uh, can Jugated cold nanoparticles with polysaccharides, for example, gelan can serve as nutrient for cancer cells. Uh, nanoparticles have absorption maximum in the visible or near eye region and they get very hot when created with the standing leg. Uh, the gold nanoparticles stabilized by gelan. Gelan was loaded by, by doxorubicin hydro, uh, hydrochloride, one of the potential and well known anti cancer drug was con conjugated with um, sulfurolipid and the cytotoxicity were evaluated with respect of human glioma, uh, glioma cell line and the human glioma stem line. Effectively. Conclusion: The unique properties of gelang gum, in particular, biocompatibility, biocompat low toxicity, biodegradability, argue the success, successful application in pharmacy and nanotechnology. The conformational and soil phase transition of gelang in model aqueous salt solutions has been established. It shown the efficiency of gelation immune models and the breaking stress of gelan enhanced in the following order. Uh, barium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, chloride. Gelan can be successfully applied in the formulation of ophthalmic uh, preparation as a sickening or gelling component. Gelan gel stabilized cold nanoparticles or synthesized uh, gel and gel present around the nanoparticles act as stabilizer, improving gold nanorod stability and the view compatibility. Um, gold nanorods have shown no towards efficient and the high potential to use uh, biomedical applications, including intercellular drug delivery. Anti-cancer drug and the gold nanoparticles immobilized with um, using gelan gel matrix is effective for treatment of cancer cells. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Jana. We can uh, have only one question, please. Very quickly. We are late. Can I have one? Uh, I noticed that you have performed your rheological studies at very high temperatures. What was the reason for like 70 degrees, 60 degrees and very high temperatures? They are not physiological. You've studied uh, it for some other purposes. Uh, first, we studied the rheological properties of Chilan for, uh, for using as uh, agent for drilling uh, fluids and uh, for reagents uh, for enhanced oil recovery. So you study this uh, interval of uh, temperature. First time you for oil chemistry. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jana, for your thank presentation. You. Uh, let me please announce the next speaker, Ibrahim Shah from the University of Reading. Uh, I will not read this, this is the title, please. Ibrahim. Uh, hi, my name is Ibrahim. I'm going to uh, today. I'm going to talk about the use of planaria toxicity model uh, for the detection or for the pre-screening tool to detect the uh, potential skin irritants. So, uh, what are planaria? Planaria are basically uh, simple flatworms that are found in the fresh water. Uh, they are commonly they have been commonly used in different developmental models. And, and they are currently used in different type of toxicological models as well. So uh, what we are looking here, uh, basically planaria have simple uh, uh, outer epidermal membranes. So uh, uh, what we, uh, we hypothesize here is that whenever a compound will, co will come in contact with the planaria, if they are toxic, they will destroy or they will damage the outer membranes of the planaria. Greater the toxicity, greater should be the damage to the planaria membranes. And hence, there should be more uptake of fluorescence dye within the planaria. So by measuring the fluorescence material with inside the planaria, we can actually detect 
the damage caused to the planar membranes by the different toxic materials and then uh, correlating it with this human skin. So for this purpose, we developed a simple assay. Uh, that simple assay consists of four uh, main steps. The first step was uh, to take a petri dish. I will move to the next slide. Uh, the first step was to take an area and put it in, in a petri dish. Uh, that petri dish contained our required uh, 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 chemical uh, toxic compound. And that uh, um, within that petri dish, the plain area should be allowed for one minute. After that minute, uh, one minute, the plain area was moved on to another petri dish containing the fresh uh, APW, the artificial pond water. Then it was allowed, uh, then it was put into the petri dish containing the fluorescent dye, uh, again putting it for one minute and then uh, moving the planar again for one minute into the APW to remove the adsorbed dye on, onto the surface of the planaria. The final step was uh, in order to immobilize planaria, we, uh, put, uh, we put the planaria onto the microscopic slide and use acarose gel to immobilize planaria. And then we use the fluorescent microscope to see how much of the fluorescence has been taken within, within the planaria body. Uh, uh, so in this in this particular experiment, we use different uh, sets of uh, irritant compounds that are irritant to the skin. So we broadly uh, differentiated these compounds into four major classes: the strong irritants, moderate irritants, mild irritant, and non-irritants. The basis of this uh, classification criteria was the primary irritation index. So primary irritation index is basically uh, a, a mean of and uh, showing that how, how much toxic a compound is toward the human skin. So the strong irritants have the highest primary irritation index value, while the non-irritants have the lowest uh, primary irritation index value. While the control use here was the uh, medium alone, that is the artificial pond water with fluorescein. As we can see that uh, greater was the irritation potential of the compound, higher the fluorescent intensity, higher, higher the fluorescent intensity was. And when we moved from uh, strong irritants toward the uh, no, uh, uh, low irritants, that the irritation, uh, sorry, the fluorescent intensity of uh, these compounds also decreases. Uh, next is the images. So these are some uh, uh, exemplar images of different uh, of, of different compounds and as you can see the from the and the a is basically the uh, autofluorescence and the o is uh, o is and then it moves towards the higher group of irritants uh, and 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 the o is basically the benzyl chlor chloride which basically represent the uh, most toxic compound towards the human skin so what we can see the trend is that by increasing the toxicity we can see the accumulation of fluorescein within the plane uh, the accumulation of fluorescein within the plain area also increases uh, <clears throat> and the last uh, results were correlating uh, our data with the primary index. Uh, the reason for this correlation was that because we chose primary irritation index as a mean to select compounds. So what we wanted to see was that how much, uh, how much of the correlation is there between the primary irritation index and the first intensity of first intensity basically shows our own results. So by uh, drawing the plot, we found that uh, this data was highly uh, correlative with the strong correlation of uh, Pearson correlation of 0.90 which shows that uh, by using primary irritation index as a mean, we can basically use uh, our model to predict the irritation of the compounds towards the human skin. So in, in conclusion, uh, we can uh, from this uh, um, uh, we can conclude that we can use this model to basically predict the irritation of unknown compounds that we don't know what will be their uh, irritation towards the human skin. And then uh, by using that uh, uh, model, we can basically predict the irritation of, of these unknown compounds to the uh, human skin. Uh, at, uh, at last, I would like to thank my uh, supervisor, Professor Adrian Williams and Professor Ali Triansky, my group members, uh, my lovely plan area, and my sponsors. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Any questions, comments, please? Okay.
Uh, I have one question, please. Yes. Uh, yes. Slide number seven. And uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, here we can see uh, information about fluorescence from uh, your plan area. And uh, yes. in each uh, picture, area has a different form. Uh, and uh, if you can see uh, picture number O, we, we have a spherical yeah. form. Fluorescent signal goes from all surface. That's why we have a, a huge fluorescence because, because we have a, a spherical forms of one area. Uh, uh, no. uh, how do you think? Uh, from another side, if you will use the confocal microscopy, you can yeah. find a, a slide uh, which cannot um, uh, can, uh, cannot be uh, connected with the form of your planet. And um, maybe your fluorescence goes from uh, uh, increase because you have a spherical form of planet or not, how do you think? Yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, what we did was that we basically normalized all of these planaria. So the surface state of all these planaria was actually normalized. Uh, so we were, for example, if in picture O, if it has a surface area of one centimeter, and if in picture A, if it has a surface area of two centimeter, so we were mm -hmm. taking the, uh, dividing the obtained fluorescent intensity, and then mm -hmm. dividing it it, it with the area. So all of the data in the slide six is basically the normalized data that you oh, obtained right. from oh. our from this image. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Actually, let, me, so let me make yes. So it, it, uh, Ibrahim, uh, very nice. <laughs> So okay. it is. It is a, a rapid test. It is in a, a possibly a, a cheap test. What, what kind of applications do you see with this? Uh, 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 the, uh, for for this particular experiment, we basically aim for skin irritants. Like uh, we wanted to make a test that is simple and cheap that can basically detect uh, the potential irritants toward the human skin. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to introduce the next speaker, Natalia Porfirieva from Kazan State Medical University from Russia. Uh, title of her presentation, Accelerated and Dragit, is a adhesive material for intranasal drug delivery. Please, Natalia. Thank you very much for your introduction. So. Please, Natalia. Thank you very much for your introduction. Okay. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to present our results on the synthesis of a related pharmaceutical polymer, Eudragit EPO, and its application as a metagasive material for intranasal drug delivery. Uh, in recent years, nasal administration has gained a lot of interest uh, due to the possibility for bypassing the blood-brain barrier. However, the mucus layer in the nasal cavity could act as a barrier which may reduce the efficiency of drug delivery. One potential approach to improve uh, the intranasal drug delivery is we use cationic polymer modified with acrylation. Well known, uh, cationic polymer have excellent mucoadhesive properties due to their ability to interact with negatively charged mucins. Acrylated groups uh, are capable of forming covalent linkages with TOs presence in mucins under physiological conditions. In our work, we have used pharm cationic pharmaceutical polymer manufactured by German concern Evonik under Eudragi trademark. We have used one type of cationic polymer, Eudragi EPO. This ter polymer contains 25% of dimethyl amino groups that opens up an uh, interesting opportunity for its chemical modification through acrylation. 
So the aim of our project was to chemically modify YIPO by reaction with acrylaol chloride. Uh, we have characterized their structure and physical chemical behavior. Uh, for investigating its toxicological properties, we used slug mucosal irritant test. Uh, and finally, we have studied the mucoadhesive properties of modified polymer on freshly exist ship nasal mucosa. In the beginning of this project, we have uh, modified EPO by reaction with acrylaol chloride and synthesized two types uh, of acrylated EPO with 25 and 50% substitution of the dimethyl amino groups. These products uh, were isolated using dialysis through cellulose membranes. So in the next step, we have studied pharmaceutical physical chemical properties of acrylated polymers in contrast with uh, parent EPO. The FTA R spectra uh, of acrylated polymers show the presence of a new band at 1,600 reciprocal centimeters, indicating the attachment of additional carbonyl groups uh, to EPO. The protein in the mass spectrum of acrylated EPO show the appearance of a new, new multiplet, which uh, confirmed the presence of alkene functional groups of acrylol chloride in modified polymers. The differential scanning thermograms demonstrate changes in glass transition temperature of modified polymers compared to EPO indicated the successful derivatization of EPO. The thermogravimetric analysis show a decrease in the thermal stability of modified polymer that it possibly related to the presence of acrylaol groups. So in the next step, uh, we have investigated the degrees of acrylation of EPO using back permanganometric titration. EPO, parent EPO, contains 22.6 of uh, quaternary amino groups. According to this, the modified polymers should have 5.65 and 11.30% of acrylaol groups. These numbers uh, they are confirmed by back, back permanganometric titration. So for investigation uh, toxicological properties uh, of modified polymers, we use slug mucosa irrit irritation test. This uh, slug mucosa irritation test demonstrates non-irritant uh, nature of, e of parent EPO, negative control as a artificial nasal fluid and modified polymers in contrast with a positive control with benzalkonium chloride. The mucargasive properties uh, of EPO and acrylated EPO were studied on freshly exist sheet nasal mucosa irrigated with artificial nasal fluid. It was established uh, that EPO retains of the dye on mucosal surface, surfaces better compared to free sodium fluorescein. Uh, however, acrylated EPO facilitated even greater retention properties uh, on nasal mucosa compared, of, compared to parent EPO. So, thus, in my talk, uh, I have demonstrated how we modified EPO and characterized uh, its physical, chemical, toxicological, and mucoadhesive properties. Acrylated polymers exhibit superior mucoadhesive properties on nasal mucosa tissue compared to parent EPO. Acrylated, so thus we can say uh, acrylated EPO can potentially be used as a mucoadhesive material for formulation dosage form 
for internet of drug delivery. I would like to thank uh, the Minister of Education and Science to the Republic of Tatarstan for Garish grant supporting. Uh, I also grateful to my supervisors, Professor Mustafin and Professor Taransky. Uh, and uh, I grateful to research groups and collaborators from Kazan State Medical University and University of Reading for helping me with experiments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalia, for your nice presentation. Uh, only one question. Yes. <laughs> Only one question, please. Natalia, thank you for a very nice presentation, very clear. With the nasal mucosa, are there two layers of mucus covering the nose, an outer layer that's mobile and an inner layer that is adhered to the mucosal membrane? So does your APO go through the mobile phase and stick to the underlying thickly bound mucus, or does it just move across the surface with the rest of the mucus? We guess uh, when our polymers um, go through the mucus because uh, on nasal tissue, uh, on we can clearly see the presence of our polymers. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I want to. Uh, this is the present call speakers, and I will give. This is my turn to Mustafa, right? Professor Ruslan, you will continue, Next. okay? Okay, dear colleagues, uh, we said the final part. So first of all, I would like to say uh, a, a, a few words about uh, our organizer, Professor Vitaly Khutarian. So we are very glad that he could uh, think to organize such kind of conference so when uh, comes together uh, three countries so it's okay of course and uh, now we are moving to the third part um, and i will give a uh, uh, talk to jamila al mahruni from the university of reading uk with the title of diffusion of theolated and pegylated silica nanoparticles into the vitreous humor Are you ready? Okay. Uh, so I've made some modification to the presentation title. I will present both the, the diffusion of uh, dilated and pigilated uh, silica nanoparticles into the vitreous humor and also another um, uh, research, which I did it on hair follicles as well. So to start with, vitreous humor is a gel-like substance which is uh, uh, present on the vitreous body, which is mainly composed of 99% of, almost 99% of water and um, uh, collagen fibers, uh, which um, uh, forms a networks with hyaluronic acid and uh, some other substances. It also has some non-collagenous proteins and free amino acids like uh, cysteine and uh, human albumin and some small amounts of trace metals and elements. So um, our nanoparticles are uh, synthesized via subsequent hydrolysis and condensation of three mercaptopropyl trimethoxyselene um, and um, the resulting nanoparticles are already functionalized with the uh, thiol groups and they have an average uh, size of 45 nanometers and uh, a negative zeta potential. Uh, they can be easily uh, labeled with the uh, chlorophores like 5-iodocetamide uh, fluorescein and um, um, they can be easily also um, um, decorated with the pig. And in my experiments, I use different molecular weights of pig, like uh, 750 Daltons, 5,000, and 10,000 Daltons. 
and pigulation uh, caused like an uh, increase in the particle size and um, um, but still zeta potential uh, was negative and um, um, the reduc there was a reduction in uh, thiol content due to the uh, combination of, uh, uh, of the uh, reaction of the thiol groups with the pig uh, uh, polymer. So for uh, uh, intravitreous uh, diffusion, uh, we used bovine eyes and um, 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 uh, the uh, vitreous content of the, um, of the vitreous humor was, uh, vitreous body was uh, poured into a, the, a cuvette and the nanoparticles were applied on the top of the, of the, um, um, uh, of the vitreous humor. Uh, it was noticed that thiolated silica nanoparticles um, uh, stayed on the surface of the cuvette, on the surface of the vitreous vitre humor without any further penetration or uh, diffusion uh, for up to 24 hours, uh, which uh, could be related possibly to the presence of cysteine in this um, uh, uh, vitreous uh, humor. Uh, which is highly reactive to the thiol groups which are present on the nanoparticles and plus with the, uh, for the, uh, due to the presence of collagen and hyaluronate uh, fiber networks which can trap the nanoparticles and uh, um, uh, prevent them from movement. However, when the nanoparticles were modified with the pigylation, um, uh, diffusion uh, had been uh, like um, uh, noticed uh, over time uh, an event uh, like diffusion but uh, with a complete diffusion by the end of 24 hours and the same pattern was seen with the three types of uh, or three uh, molec uh, different molecular weights uh, of pig. Um, um, and uh, in, this, in these experiments um, I used sodium fluorescein also as a positive control as it is uh, a small molecule and can diffuse easily to the uh, uh, vitreous humor. Um, um, the sodium fluorescein uh, diffused by 24 hours, but in slower um, uh, diffusion rate compared to the um, uh, pigulated uh, silica nanoparticles. And when these images were um, uh, analyzed using uh, image software, um, the, uh, there was a significant difference, of course, between uh, the thiolated silica nanoparticles, which did not diffuse at all, uh, uh, and uh, all the other uh, pigulated uh, uh, formulations, and also with the positive control, which was sodium fluorescein. But it was not significantly different between uh, the three pairs of uh, pig and also between uh, 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 this one. Um, sodium fluorescein and pigulated nanoparticles. There was no dif significant difference between them. Um, if we move on to the next set of experiments, which uh, focused on the um, uh, diffusion of nanoparticles on, uh, to the hair follicles. So the main entrance route for um, uh, nanoparticles uh, through the skin uh, is either uh, through intercellular pathway or uh, uh, follicular pathway. So uh, um, before uh, go taking any experiments, the stability of these nanoparticles was, uh, was uh, studied. Uh, so um, um, the nanoparticles were incubated with the um, uh, skin homogenate and um, uh, dialyzed against uh, phosphate buffer and the um, uh, fluorescence in sit intensity. Uh, these nanoparticles are labeled. So the fluorescence intensity of the uh, dialysate was checked over time to check if there is any release of the fluorophore from the nanoparticles, which indicates um, uh, um, the, the destruction or uh, um, uh, uh, destruction or release uh, uh, of the nanoparticles and from uh, due to the incubation with skin. So um, the, um, the, uh, the results showed like um, a significant difference from 
uh, between the homogenate uh, and nanoparticles uh, uh, mixture, uh, labeled nanoparticles mixture, and the positive control, which was the uh, sodium fluorescein. Um, uh, sodium fluorescein was released from, um, from the first hour, uh, but, uh, then, um, uh, but the nanoparticles were not released up to uh, almost 24 hours, which indicates the stability of our nanoparticles in skin homogenate. On the other hand, uh, the nanoparticles, uh, the labeled nanoparticles showed significant difference also with the positive control, would not release like a very small amount released um, over time, over 72 hours compared to the uh, dialysate compared to the positive control, sorry. So uh, tape stripping studies, uh, uh, experiments were carried to, um, uh, to quantify, uh, to, uh, uh, to, um, for, to check the penetration or diffusion of the nanoparticles. So the samples uh, were applied on uh, pig flank skin and uh, massaged for a minute and incubated for two hours. Then uh, tape strips were applied on top of the skin and uh, uh, pressure applied on it. Then subsequent uh, tape stripping uh, of 20 tape strips was done and images of the whole skin and the uh, tape strip were, was uh, taken using fluorescent microscope. After each experiment, the tissue was dissectioned and uh, uh, images of the skin sections uh, were taken using uh, fluorescent microscopy. In addition to this, the tape strips were uh, centrifuged in phosphate buffer and the fluorescent intensity of this uh, mixture was checked using uh, fluorescent spectroscopy. Um, um, the analysis of, um, uh, of the nanoparticles on uh, the layers of skin removed uh, on top tape strips was, um, was evaluated using uh, fluorescent spectroscopy and the, um, 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 as the tape strips were, were weighed uh, prior and after tape stripping, so uh, we had the, uh, the weight removed of the skin of stratum corneum layer. So uh, with measuring the fluorescence intensity of each tape strip um, um, after, uh, after tape stripping, uh, we could um, like uh, indicate uh, the presence or absence of uh, the nanoparticles uh, on, the, on that layer of the skin. And um, uh, the, uh, when these data were analyzed, they showed non-significant difference between uh, the amount removed uh, of um, pigelated silica nanoparticles with significant difference between positive control and phylated silica nanoparticles which were removed uh, from the skin. Uh, further, uh, these, uh, the section, sections of skin were uh, uh, evaluated using uh, fluorescence uh, microscopy. And uh, here we can see that sodium fluorescein is clearly there and the, uh, in, uh, have uh, diffused into the hair follicle. Uh, this uh, image shows the thiolated silica nanoparticles, which show that they are on top of the skin and they did not diffuse into the hair follicles. Um, uh, small amounts of pig were seen in the hair follicles in the, uh, under the microscope, either seven, uh, pig uh, 750 daltons or pig 5000 daltons. Uh, when uh, these images were analyzed using ImageJ software, uh, they showed like significant difference between uh, the, the diffusion of uh, nanoparticles, the related silica nanoparticles, um, uh, and uh, positive control with these are not diffusing at all or to a very little extent compared to uh, uh, our positive control. There was also a significant difference in diffusion between the pigulated silica nanoparticles 750 and 5000 uh, daltons with a better diffusion in the case of uh, 5000 daltons thiolated silica nanoparticles. Um, 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 uh, in conclusion, uh, we could uh, show that uh, uh, 
dilated silica nanoparticle had uh, like a limited or no diffusion into the vitreous body and hair follicles. Uh, this, this could be related to the presence of um, uh, thiol groups on the top of the, um, of the, of the, on the surface of the nanoparticles. And it was, was also um, uh, reported that these nanoparticles have uh, mucoadhesive adhesive uh, properties and they showed uh, adhesion to the surface of the, uh, to the cornea and uh, to the also uh, bladder. Um, and uh, uh, also it was shown that pigilation improved the diffusion of the nanoparticles significantly. And the same, have, uh, the same was reported in uh, previous uh, uh, research done by our group. Also, um, uh, they, uh, the pigilated nanoparticles showed, uh, improved the diffusion of the nanoparticles uh, into the eye and also um, into the, through the cornea and also in the uh, bladder. Although its uh, pigilation decreased the mucoadhesion, but uh, improved the diffusion. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Question? Any questions? Yeah. Is it any questions, please? Everything is clear, I think. Thank you. If not any questions, thank you very much. Thank so you. To another um, speaker. So it's Balnur Baeva from Nazarbayev University from Kazakhstan. Uh, the title of the presentation is Cell Penetrating Organosilica Nanoparticles for Drug Delivery. So please. Did Balnur ready? So, okay, let's see your presentation. Hello, now can you hear me now? Yes, okay. Yeah, okay. So uh, my name is Balnur Rizanbaeva. I'm a second year PhD student at Nazarbayev University. And today I'll be talking about the cell penetrating silicon nanoparticles for drug delivery. So my uh, supervisors are Professor Hutaryansky, Professor Hartalanov, and Professor Vorobyov uh, from Nazarbayev University and Dr. Moon. So uh, the outlines of today's presentation, um, sorry. So uh, briefly, I will give an introduction about the different drug delivery methods and uh, show you the advances of the organosilicon nanoparticles. And then I will show uh, the results of the in vitro toxicological studies that has been that have been done and also in vitro localization of the nanoparticles and further um, I'll share with you the future application of those nanoparticles. So as you know nanomedicine can be defined as a nanotechnology or materials between 1 to 100 nanometers applied in health or medicine and it's a emerging uh, method for treating cancer and co current problems in treating cancer include low specific specificity uh, rapid drug clearance and biodegradation of the target and limited targeting so those the different nanocarriers can be uh, used in order to prolong the um, prolong and targetly deliver the drug. At the moment, there are different methods uh, that are used to deliver drugs, including lipid-based nanocarriers, uh, nano polymer-based drug conjugates, viral nanoparticles, and inorganic uh, nanoparticles. So the use of those nanoparticles may uh, increase the biocompatibility and biodegradability and also variety of, uh, of architecture and materials and forms can be used to increase the stability and increase the 
targeting delivery of the drugs. And uh, one of the nanoparticles that are uh, highly studied re in recent years is organosilica nanoparticles. So uh, those nanoparticles are uh, unique in that they are inexpensive, they are cheap to synthesize and also uh, they are highly reproducible and we can control the size during the synthesis. And other, other advantages, of, advantages of the organosilica nanoparticles is the biocompatibility. So according to the recent uh, studies, we can see that the organosilica nanoparticles are biocompatible compared to other types of inorganic nanoparticles. And also the biodistribution of organosilica nanoparticles showed that uh, they can uh, go through the biodegradation in vivo and then and those the exertion of the nanoparticles was studied. And also the delivery methods due to the um, opportunities of different modification of the nanoparticles, we can um, change the delivery methods using different pH triggers or enzyme triggers, magnetic triggers, and etc. And it can be applied in the delivery of genes, of proteins, as an antimicrobial therapy, and also it can be used in um, diagnostics as well as in drug delivery. So in this study, uh, in this work, we will use it for drug delivery methods. And uh, in this presentation, I'll show you the biocompatibility and biodistribution in vitro. So the synthesis of the nanoparticles was described before by Jamila and also it was developed by Dr. Moon. And it goes through the three main steps, the hydrolysis, nucleation, and aggregation. And then we will get, we'll, uh, get nanoparticles with active tile groups on the surface. And the size distribution of the nan of nanoparticles around 45 nanometers. And further pigulation of those nanoparticles didn't uh, increase size as much. So the, and also the Raman spectra shows the high, the distinct peaks of, peaks of tile groups. Uh, and here you can see TM images uh, and TM image shows us that those nanoparticles are monodispersed and the size is around 40-45 nanometers. <clears throat> so more, uh, in this, uh, the second steps that we did is the evaluation of the cytotoxicity and one of the main techniques to evaluate the cytotoxicity of any material is MTT uh, proliferation assay. So MTT is a yellow substance uh, which reduces to the purple insoluble formazan crystals in mitochondria and thus uh, it um, uh, gives us the number of viable cells. So this method is directly relate, related to the number of viable cells. So we use two cell lines, it's a human embryo kidney cell line, HEC293, and a breast cancer cell line, MCF7. And they were incubated with nanoparticles for 24 and 48 hours at different concentrations. And then the cells were incubated with MTT assay, uh, dye solution uh, with MTT dye solution and this um, so living cells they convert the tetrazolium com component of this dye into the uh, purple formazan and absorbance at 570 nanometers was recorded and the percentage of the viable cells were calculated. So on this graph we can see that the, uh, those nanoparticles seems to be non-toxic, even at higher concentrations. However, uh, like if we look at the 48 hour, so starting from the high concentrations like 600, 800 and 1000 microgram per mil, we can see the significant drop of the uh, viable cell numbers. However, according to the International Organization for Standardization and tests for the in vitro cytotoxicity uh, of medical devices, if the viability uh, of the in vitro viability drops below 70%, 
the material is tend to be uh, toxic and thus non-biocompatible. However, in this work, uh, we didn't observe, observe any drop of the viability below 70% only in this case, uh, which is 1000 microgram per milliliter. But we should consider that this, uh, con that these taken concentrations are not physiological, so, um, uh, so not physiological and this concentration cannot be applied in vivo. So uh, most of the studies, they use the concentration between zero and 200 microgram per mil. And here we exceeded to 1000 microgram per mil to see when, they will, when they, we will reach the limit of the toxicity. Uh, so the next step is um, also other test for the uh, in vitro cytotoxicity using the PI Propidium iodide exclusion method via flow cytometer. <clears throat> so here we evaluated the tox toxicity on uh, HEC 293 cell lines and also used different um, concentration of nanoparticles. So on this graph, you can see the on y axis. Uh, oh, sorry, let me tell you about the propidium iodide dye. Propidium iodide is a dye that stains nuclei of dying or dead cells. So therefore, by the evaluating the concentration of the propidium iodide in cell culture, we can observe the percentage of dead or dying cells. So y-axis here represents the PI, and uh, everything uh, on top of the y-axis is the percentage number of dead cells. <clears throat> on, this, uh, on this histogram, we can see two peaks. So the large peak, this one represents the number, uh, represents the peak for uh, live cells, and this peak is the peak for dead cells. So uh, after the incubation with uh, nanoparticles, we observed that there is no significant difference between the control group and the group uh, of cells treated with nanoparticles. However, the, uh, only at the concentration of 400 microgram per, microgram per mil, we observed the high number of dead cells. However, these results are preliminary and we cannot draw full conclusion. So here we incubated tilated silicon nanoparticles with HEC 293 cells, and then uh, we incubated PEG 5000 cells with, uh, uh, sorry, HEC 293 cells with uh, pigulated nanoparticles. And here again, we didn't observe much um, difference between the number of dead and live cells. <clears throat> Further, we investigated the uh, cellular localization of nanoparticles. So uh, we studied the permeability of nanoparticles through the cellular membrane. So on this slide, you can observe the HEC-293 cell lines that were incubated with uh, dilated nanoparticles and uh, pigulated nanoparticles with PEG with molecular uh, weight of 750 for two, four, and six hours. And the nanoparticles were labeled with ATO488 iodostamide dye, which is a green colored dye. And um, cells were fixed and stained with Alexa Floor 555 phalladine and DAPI. So Alexa Floor 555 phalladine, it stains as a red color and represents the actin filaments of the cell, while DAPI is the blue stain that uh, stains nuclei, and green color is the representation of the nanoparticles. So uh, according to these results, we can see that dilated nanoparticles highly aggregate in cellular membrane within the cell, uh, while, pigulated while the penetration of pigulated nanoparticles is much lower compared to the dilated nanoparticles. And also here we, we can observe that pigulated nanoparticles are mostly concentrated on the cell surface. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, same was done with the uh, with other cell line is the breast cancer cell line, and here uh, we used PEG 750 and PEG 2000 uh, incubated cells for two, four, and six hours. And here we can again observe that. Uh, by the time the, we can see the accumulation of nanoparticles uh, within the cell <clears throat> uh, and uh, pigulated nanoparticles, uh, PEG 750 also uh, accumulated inside the cell. However, the number of uh, penetrated nanoparticles was much lower compared to the tilated. And PEG 2000 uh, shows that the number of the nanoparticles um, localized, localized inside the cell is significantly lower as well. So these results can suggest that the pigulation of nanoparticles may redeem nanoparticles from in vivo toxicity, helping in escape the immune uh, from the immune cells because as you can see the tilated nano the penetration of tilated nanoparticles is not dependent on the cell type so uh, in while uh, apl applying these nanoparticles in vivo we can uh, stimulate the immune response thus the pigulation might help us uh, to reduce that immune response well, no, I'm sorry but uh, the time is over already Oh, okay, so I'll be very quick. And then we did the 3D modeling of those uh, images, uh, 3D modeling. And here again, we observed that the tilated nanoparticles accumulate uh, much more uh, nanoparticles compared to the pigulated uh, nanoparticles. So for the future work, we are planning to use um, glutathione that is the antioxidant present in cell and the concentration of the glutathione is much higher in uh, in cells and in cancer cells compared to the ex extracellular concentration of the uh, glutathione and thus by the glutathione we can uh, uh, we can release the drug that will be attached to our nanoparticles. So, and then the targeting uh, of the nanoparticles will be <clears throat> uh, the tar uh, for targeted delivery, we will be using different uh, antibodies or antibody fragments for the HER2 positive breast cancer, uh, breast cancer. And then we will uh, evaluate the in, in vivo pro-inflammatory and by distribution of the nanoparticles. So thank you very much for your attention and my acknowledgement to the Professor Kuteransky and his group, also to the Erasmus program. And uh, thank you very much. So thank you for your presentation due to mm -hmm. we, uh, we are not in time, so we will not time for questions to you. Sorry, sorry for that. Okay, yeah, no problem. So we are moving to our last presentation, uh, which is go to Roman Moisey from the University of Reading uh, with the title of the presentation, Ex vivo Ophthalmatic Models in Ocular Drug Delivery. Please, Roman. So we see your presentation. We start. Hello. Right, now you can hear me, I guess. Okay, hello everyone. According to the World Health Organization, the estimated number of people who live with some form of distance or near vision impairment is about 1.3 billion worldwide. And the visual pathway processes about 80% of external input of information delivered to the brain. So there are a few options for uh, ocular drug delivery, including injections, while eye drops are one of the most convenient formulations. The outermost layer helps to maintain the spherical shape of the eyeball and consists of the cornea and sclera. It is well known that less than 5% of the topically applied drugs penetrate through the cornea, 
which consists of six different layers. The epithelium permeability accounts up to 90% for the lipophilic substances and almost totally excluding macromolecules. Hence, the corneal epithelium is the main limitation for intracorneal drug delivery. In contrast, the stroma provides a great barrier for lipophilic compounds of a small size. Interestingly, the endothelium layer is slightly more imperable for uh, small lipophilic molecules compared to the corneal stroma. However, macromolecules cross endothelium more easily than corneal stroma. The permeability of sclera is relatively close to that of the corneal stroma. Another layer providing the eyeball with protection is called the conjunctiva, and all three portions of which are shown in the picture. The data on conjunctival permission is quite poor, but according to some reports, it demonstrates a higher permeability compared to the cornea. So recently, a few different exhibible models were used to evaluate permeability and drug absorption by the cornea. Thus, according to Agarwal and Rupanel, cell-based models are commonly used for studies of penetration. Advantages of these models include a relatively lower cost compared to the use of laboratory animals, as well as minimizing the number of animal studies. However, this type of model is more suitable to evaluate the sudden toxicity of the compounds rather than their permeability absorption by the cornea. This is because cell-based models are, in simple words, five to six layers of the epithelial cells of the cornea, but not the entire structure of the cornea. Additionally, these cell cultures do not have transporter molecules as well as enzymes responsible for drug metabolism. One of the closest models to the real cornea is a reconstructed tissue culture which comprises of different types of cells that help to mimic three-layer structure including epithelium, stroma, and endothelium. Okay, ex vivo corneas of various animals are also commonly used for evaluating corneal permeability and absorption. Still, these models are not ideal due to the differences in the anatomical structure compared to the human cornea, as well as the potential different enzymes and molecules of active transporters. So the anatomical parameters of rabbit, porcine, bovine, and sheep eyeballs were measured using a digital caliper and the eyeball's horizontal diameter, vertical diameter, and teratoposterior diameter, as well as the horizontal and vertical corneal diameters were measured. The rabbit eyes are commonly used as ex vivo models, but rabbit cornea does not have Bowman's layer, which results in higher penetration of substances in comparison with a human cornea. And here you can see the rabbit eyeball measurements with values of volume and sphericity. Right, the, the eyeball size, the thickness of the cornea, the ratio of the lengths of the cornea to, to eye globe diameter, and histological structure, including Bowman's membrane in porcine eyes are the closest to the human eyeball. So the results of the porcine eyeballs measurements with values of volume and spheres they presented in this table. Bovine eyes are also used in the studies of ocular tissue drug permeability, despite the fact that these are larger than the human eyes and their corneal epithelium is almost twice the thickness. And here we go, here are presented bovine eyeball measurements with values of volume. Sheep eyes are not frequently used in the studies of ocular drug permeability due to the fact that the central part of the cornea is also thicker compared to the human eyeball. And some data on sheep eyeball measurements. Okay, so this table represents the human eyeball measurements with values of volume according to the literature sources. And moving forward, so in the end, we can compare measurement values of different species and the porcine eyeball size and volume, as well as the thickness of the cornea and histological structure are the closest to the human eyeball. Hence, the porcine eyes are one of the most suitable options as the ex vivo ophthalmic model for ocular drug delivery. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Any questions, please? Doesn't hesitate. Sorry, I, I tried my best to be as fast as I can because 
we ran out of time. <laughs> so I think I did it within 10 minutes. Okay. I hope. Yeah. Any questions, colleagues? So interesting starting. We have so a lot of ice from different animals. Oh yeah, too many. <laughs> But anyway, any questions, colleagues? If we don't have, so we could uh, give um, words to our uh, administrator, Professor Hutaransky. Okay, I, I hope I will have enough time to say, but uh, thank you very much to all for your participation. And well, obviously it was the first experience of organizing this uh, conference online. And uh, well, some things I've messed up, but I think uh, it went really well, generally. I enjoyed the presentations and uh, obviously our junior researchers have learned the biggest lesson. During conferences, you need to stick to the time. And uh, if people could allow you to, to, to go longer, then unfortunately our technology sometimes doesn't allow to go longer. And, uh, but next time, if I will be ever planning anything like that, then I will be trying to uh, allow a bit more time for, for people to, uh, to, to exceed a little bit of their limit. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the, this event. I hope you had a chance to learn something new for you. If you learned at least one thing new, then it means that it was not uh, a waste of our time. I'm also happy to, uh, well, as you know, that I'm uh, doing research on retention on different surfaces, and the retention in this conference was quite good. We had maximum 35 particip participants in the first session. In the second session, uh, we had 30 uh, maximum, so 30 and 35 retention is pretty good. Okay, uh, it seems well. We are still have we still have time. The Zoom doesn't tell me that we need to finish. So I don't know if anyone wants to say anything. Then please do. I'd like to thank everyone. <laughs> Just one more time. Thank you very much, Charlie, for organizing this. Very nice. Thank you very much for this. And I'm so, so happy to see some faces which I met in Reading after a long time. So it was really a good opportunity to meet them again. I hope to see you again also in some other events. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all participants. The conference was pretty interesting. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation and especially thank you very much for agreeing to this conference. Thank you very much, Itali, for your nice organization of this conference. Uh, I think it was very useful. Uh, also, this is for all research group. And uh, in future, it will be continued, I hope. Thank you very much for all for your nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So first attempt was very nice, I think. So we have learned a lot of today. So we, we see about transdermal patches. So we see something we, we, we know about them, cell penetrating, uh, nasal drug delivery. So uh, oral drug delivery, a lot of. And most of all, uh, the uh, uh, Bioadhesive or mucoadhesive, so it's nice, of course. And we could uh, hope that uh, the second uh, conference could be much more bigger. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, participants could be joining us. And uh, I will go uh, very obliged to Vitaly Khodaryansky for organizing such kind of good event. Thank you. Thank you.